Hi, I'm Dan, and if you're new to homebrewing, so am I. Welcome to My Adventures in Homebrewing. Hey everybody, it's Dan, and it's that time once more to go around the world one more time and have a beer or two along the way. First, let me say thank you to Ryan Oxton from Spike Brewing. Ryan, you are awesome, and I look forward to talking to you some more. If you guys have ever thought about getting into stainless steel equipment, please go out and check out Spike Brewing. They have some phenomenal gear, be it from the Flex, the Flex Plus uh, fermenters, all the way up to their nano and also pro, pro, bleh, pro style brewing gear which is absolutely phenomenal stuff plus if you're looking to get into a glycol chiller look at the, what they have with penguin uh chillers they are some fantastic pieces of kit and also uh it's been a busy week here at the brewery. Uh, Escarpment Laboratories have come online as our sponsor, and I got some yeast from them. So yesterday it was a brew day, and we got a blueberry cream ale into the fermenter and got that rolling. So uh, stay tuned. So this week we're very fortunate. We're going to have Patrick Dawson, who is an author of uh, the Beer uh, it's the Beer Geeks Handbook. And it is a phenomenal read. Uh, I got this book before I even got back into home brewing, which was fantastic. So hang tight, guys. We're going to get a quick word from the sponsor, and then we'll uh, kick off with Patrick. Hey, it's Dan here one more time, and I'm happy to say that we are now, or should I say my podcast, is now sponsored by Escarpment Laboratories. Yeast production for the fermentation of the exceptional craft beer. Whether your kit is on the stovetop or in a commercial brew house, wholesale yeast and quality control for the profitable bro pro brewer community engagement and education for the discerning home brewery. If you are a craft brewer and you love using quality yeast, then you really do need to check out Escarpment Laboratories. Hey guys, we're back and let me please first introduce author Patrick Dawson. Patrick, how are you doing, bud? I'm doing really well. Thanks so much for having me on and the kind words about the book. Like that's, that's awesome. Really oh, means Honestly, the book is fantastic. The illustrations honestly kept me rolling the whole time, which was fantastic. Um, it, honestly, if it, I gotta say, it is an easy read and it also very informative, uh, especially when it comes into things like beer styles, the glasses. The glasses part kind of got me rolling. So, why so many glasses? <laughs> it's like it's a vessel, any glass really works. But I can now I understand why there's so many different glasses. Yeah, it like it's it's such a great conversation starter, if nothing else, right? You know, I mean, that's like it's the constant debate of like how much does the glass actually change the beer? Exactly. But if nothing else, just like I don't know about you, but like you know, I have a big glass like hutch with yeah. all of my glasses, and you know, people come over and they'll they'll they'll, they'll see something, some you know, some brewery glass or some specific yep. beer glass, and it just instantly, you know, you got you got something to talk about. It's great. Oh yeah, I. I got told by my wife I'm not allowed to get any more. <laughs> yep, that I same boat. It's 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 like one and one out. Like if I if I buy something, something's gotta go. <laughs> yeah, and I, I refuse to do that. No, no. <laughs> well, I don't know about you, but I feel like I break enough beer glasses. I don't know. Like I, I would when I would I have too heavy of a hand as I'm drying my beer glasses. I feel like that. That at ah. least like, I get to regularly, somewhat regularly replace them. There we go. So how about we hear a little bit about you there, Patrick? Yeah. So um I'll I'll be honest, this is this is my first foray back a little bit into the beer world in, in, in a bit. Um I started, you know, in, in real life, I'm an engineer and um I uh maybe my midlife crisis all time. It was it was a little early on, but I was I was out for a run one day. And I was like, man, I, I, I just had this motivation. I gotta do something. I gotta find a new hobby. I gotta do some beer was my hobby. I loved beer and baseball. So I was like, I run. I was like, what should I do with this little bit of extra time I've got? And I came up with that. I was either gonna like coach a baseball team mm -hmm. or I was like, I'm gonna write about beer. I love, I like, I just think about beer all the time. Like, I, I should write about it. And, and I, I, I bounced it off my wife and my, we don't, well, at the time we didn't have any kids and she's like i don't know that might be kind of weird like coaching a little kid's baseball team with no yeah. kids <laughs> i think you should write about beer yeah. it's like all right so um i just jumped in both feet and, and instead of being like oh i'm gonna write a blog or I'm gonna do this i'm like i'm gonna write a book 
And um, I, I Googled, I think like how to write a book, something like that. Yeah. And um, basically the process is you just sort of like, you can get an agent or you can just start pinging publishers. And at, at the time, what, what I was really into and um, what I felt like there was, there was a lack of information was aging beer, cellaring beer. So I was like, I know just as much about this as seemingly anyone else. I should write the book. And I just started pinging publishers, found someone that was like interested in it. We started uh, started talking and next thing I know, they offered me like a, a deal to write a book about aging beer. And that was actually my first my first book. It's called Vintage Beer. Oh, nice. And, um, and that was just like kind of like a real just passion project. Yeah, I just I just loved it. And um that that went really well and uh and then after after that they they actually had the idea for the beer game camera the publisher did he said hey would you want to write this book and you know i was like well, i don't know and, and the more i i started thinking about them i'm like oh this would be a lot of fun this would be a great book to write absolutely um, so uh so wrote that and set it off and then all of a sudden like my life totally changed i got a job offer overseas i moved overseas we had a couple of kids and like all of a sudden i didn't all that extra time I had for my beer right now disappeared and spoke. Um, so uh, I'm excited, you know, when, when someone like yourself reaches out and wants to talk about beer, it's cool. Like, uh, I don't do it as much as I'd like to. Yeah. So I, a little bit about me is, is I did 21 years in the Canadian Army. And yeah, yeah. then I got out and I was just like, what am I going to do with myself? And I went back to school for photography, I had a small business going, and then it, I closed it because just dealing with bridezillas really wasn't my thing. And <laughs> uh, and yeah. my grumpy my grumpy army sergeant side was slowly rearing its head with customers, and I was like, I can't do this. I can't. I I, I can't do this. So then. Lo and behold, I ran to a couple, some guys that I'm now really good friends with and work for. We're opening a craft brewery. Hey, congrats! That's awesome. And uh, been with them now for four years, and it's been a been a fantastic time. But that's what got me into back into, I should say, home brewing. And yeah. and like it's it's like going down a rabbit hole. It's like once you start, it just expands and expands and expands so now in my garage i have a small craft brewery in my garage from three fermenters a bright tank a glycol chiller the brewing system yeah, yeah. and now i'm i've been podcasting now for the last year about beer and it's just like my wife's like um you do realize there's more to life than beer right and i'm like there is <laughs> <laughs> So I totally understand what you're saying. So let's hear more about this fantastic hilarity of a book that you got to write. And because it's honestly, it's it, it it opens the world or the door to craft beer in a way that is very approachable. Uh, it's it's how can I say this? It is. It's not one of those idiot guides or is idiot handbooks. It is the actual definition of here. Let me show you what this is really about type of book in a really appealing way. Yeah. Well, okay. That, man, that, that is so cool to hear because when, when they approached me with it, I totally jumped to that to the conclusion. Like they wanted me to write like the idiot's guide to beer. And I was like, the books aren't even written a number of times. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not interested in that. Like, I don't do this. I'm not, I'm not doing this as a job. I'm doing this for fun. And that yeah. doesn't sound like that much fun to me. And they're like, no, no, no. That's not what we have in mind. They're like, it's like what we have in mind is the beer version of the preppy handbook. And I was like, I don't know what the preppy handbook is. That was a new thing for me. <laughs> um, and, they're, and, and so I published them. They're out on the, on the East Coast so in Massachusetts. And apparently in Massachusetts, there's this book and it was written in the 80s called like the Preppy Handbook, which is like a well-known thing. Okay, I live out in Colorado. I don't know. We'd never heard of it out there. I'd never heard of it. I've never heard of it. <laughs> and I'm so they're, like, they're like, get a copy of it and read it. And, and I did. And suddenly like the light bulb went off because so what the Preppy Handbook is, is like, um, and when I'm curious in, in, in Canada, if like Preppy means the same thing as, as in the US. So like Preppy is like, 
sort of like this like upper crust like i think it comes from prep school yeah um, kids exactly going exactly the same thing okay totally so it's like it's written it's just like super sort of like i don't want to quite say satirical it's not satirical but like this tongue-in-cheek guide yes like rate like this lifestyle this sort of like blue blood we would call it lifestyle and it is like i i was i was cracking up reading it because it's like painted in this sort of like textbook instructional way you see sort of like how silly it is but also like all these like intricacies of it that you're like totally like okay i get it and i was like after i read that I'm like okay now i envision this book i'm on the same page with you so it is it's like you can't take yourself too seriously as a beer geek right i mean like it <laughs> Because you take yourselves too seriously, you fall into the beer snob. Exactly, exactly. So that, like, as soon as I read that, it kind of got those like creative juices flowing. That I was like, okay, no one, no one has written this book. Like, this is a new, this would be a new fun thing. And uh, yeah, just that, that was sort of like the the intro into it. And um, and it was funny because I, I I started writing it just like text, right? Open up like a word document, and you just start typing, and, and that's how I you know, did a lot of my writing. And then I realized like, no, nah, that's not really this so much. This is really like a collection of just like almost like magazine little, yeah, like type quizzes, like little insets, things like that. So like, it's it's written in a way that you, like it's not sequential. You don't sit there and read it from front to back. Yeah. You, know, you just pick it up like a magazine and kind of flip through it and, and have like little tidbits. <laughs> so how did you, how did the, how did the um, I guess, uh the titles beer geek and beer snob come to be because i i totally yeah. totally get it um with, with the geek there we're enthusiastic we want to share what we know but we're not imposing snobs well they just they are what they are <laughs> yeah well and you know what's awesome like okay so like what was what was kind of fun about like writing that book was like i got i i suddenly was in a position that like hey you know like Nobody has to really like, totally define these type of things. I'm going to, you know, just with my umpteen years of drinking craft beer, I'm, you know, <laughs> I think I'm, I'm as good as anybody to sort of like lay this out. Um, and, and I think like really, to be honest, like since I wrote that book, like the, the, I wrote this book, like I wrote the bulk of the, the text in like 2015. Mm -hmm. um, so like at that time, there was like, I feel like a, a bigger divide between uh, like the average beer lover and, and just, you know, your average Joe, right? Yeah. I think that that, that has come together so much more, you know, like most people out there have some like little local neighborhood brewery now that they've tried, you know, work their way through different styles. Like they're not as intimidated by beer, but there was this bigger gap back then where I think that that did bring out this attitude of like superiority against or with some of these like beer connoisseurs, let's call them, where they were just felt like, you know, they, they had this like uh this edge on the people that just didn't get it um and i don't experience that as much anymore i don't know about you but it, it seems yeah. like yeah like every everybody's on board with beer anymore yeah well that's, that's the thing you hear where i live in in ottawa is that the craft beer scene it's more of a giant community where no one's out to uh get ahead of the other person uh, when it comes to the craft breweries here uh, where I live, we're very much out to help each other. So we could reach out to say a competitor and say, hey, look, we need this yeast. Do you have it? Like, yeah, absolutely. How much do you need? Well, we need this. Yeah, come get it. And we're like, all right, well, in return, let us know. We'll, we'll replace it. Or if you need grain or anything else, let us know. We'll help you out. And over the, during the, I guess, during the duration of the pandemic, there have been some really tight times from, for some of the brewers and we've all been out there to help each other out. It's kind of the same thing in the homebrew world. I mean, I found here that with a lot of the guys that I know, I know there are home brewers here where I live. Uh, we're very much, Hey, look, I'm looking for this. Do you have it? Yeah, sure. What's, uh, what do you want for it? a couple of bottles of beer done? You, you come over, you give them a couple of bottles of beer and you're good to go. I mean, uh, I, I picked up, I've actually picked up a couple of the small wine fridges that yeah. one I use for like, like cold storage of 
beer and yeast and everything else. Another one I use as a fermentation chamber during the winter. So I totally understand that, you know, beer scenes have evolved into more of a community than anything else. But there's always that one person who is, who's got a, okay, this is going to be an explicit show. So <laughs> there's always that one person who's got to stick up their ass who wants to shit all over everybody yeah yeah no right it's just like i don't know what the percentage of the population is right five percent ten percent that that guy exists everywhere um i don't feel like maybe maybe he's he's not as prevalent as he once was but yeah like yeah get back to your whole your your original question which is great one is like the difference between like beer geek and beer snob i think like just like the sort of the litmus test is like are you excited to share your love of beer and bring more people into that community? Mm -hmm. And like, are you willing to like, Hey, I'm going to like take, take this down a step, like to, to, to somebody that's maybe new to to beer to really get them excited about it. Or are you going to use that knowledge and your experience as like this superiority over them? Yeah. Yeah. Just be like, Oh, oh, you've never heard of this brewery. Oh, you don't know how rare this beer is, you know, um, sort, sort of thing. And, uh, yeah, they'll, I, they'll always be around, right? You're never going to get rid of There's them. no way. Totally. There's no way. Yeah. So how did you learn about, like, people doing trades for beers and things like that? Because like, I didn't know about these, like, trading or looking for rare beers until I read the book. And I was like, holy shit, that's a really good idea. And I'm like, holy yeah. crap, there is a huge hunt for these things. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. And I feel like it's even, like, cooled off a little bit, like, in the sense that, like, there's always there's always something like there's some phenomenon i'm sure somebody's written about it but like of like that like collectible like fervor that people get Mm -hmm. like when i was a kid it was like baseball cards or yeah yeah. hockey cards everything else yeah yeah and people get into it they don't even totally like the medium right like i didn't even really read comic books as a kid but i collected them and to be honest it was because it was like like some some buddies did but it was also just this like this like you get a fever like oh my god i got that i gotta get this rare thing and that swept through beer as well and um wow it was it was like wow i I feel like we're i like where we're at now we're like um the industry has like realized that there's this niche of people that just want these like wild outlandish awesome beers and they're willing to pay like what it costs to make them right because some of these beers are really expensive to make yeah yeah and back in the day like brewers would just be like man i can't i can't make that investment because no one's going to pay x dollars for a beer wrong and then like that i mean that that is that narrative has been destroyed right I mean, absolutely people, people have shown they're going to pay a lot of money for a beer but then it came along with it that that collecting mania um and and uh you know like when i was a kid in comic books and, and baseball cards it's like the internet now exists so you can use the internet to trade these beers all over the country and like i guess really now that i think about it it's 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 really similar to that beer geek beer snob thing too where there's like you you kind of have to go through like the the foray of finding like good like like trading partners we call it right because there's right. some people they're like they're out to like win the trade you know it's like oh man you know like, and you've been to these beer tastes i'm sure we're like oh you wouldn't believe all I had, like, I, I, I traded this and, and I only had to give this up or whatever, you know, it's like, oh, I, I did so great. I have, I know so much more about beer and this idiot traded this beer. And then like, there's other people that are like, they're just more into like, I want to share beer. Like yeah, yeah. I'm excited about whatever my local, my regional, like rare beers are. And I want to, I want to check out other people's and I just want to like, spread that like beer, like excitement. And, um, yeah, it's so beer trading, like, oh, it's it's funny because back in the day, I used to be really into, like, the rare stuff, like, more like Lambix, barrel edge stuffs, things like that, and now, like, I'm more into, like, trading for rare lagers, right? Like, <laughs> rare in the sense that, like, some little brewery that doesn't distribute, right? right. Like, you, you gotta, they maybe they distribute in their town or whatever, um, and you hear great things, and I've got my little local lager breweries, too, and, like, just <laughs> swaps for loggers right so yeah um but it's fun it's fun to get to try just like what other people are doing and yeah i know i understand what you're saying with uh uh the collections and the right the rare stuff because there's a brewery here in ontario called collective arts i don't know if you have them down in the states no, uh i have not run across them but 
but they have a, they do a series every year called the Origins of Darkness, which is all bur- barrel aged bourbon stouts, yeah. and they do it with a collab from uh, other breweries that they know of, and it's been a wild ride. There's been like some crazy freaking combos. Like there's been a miso one. Uh, oh, there's yeah. been a, a sugar donut. Uh, there's been one with uh, radish, honey, and wahio chilies. Uh, <laughs> that one was actually really, really good. Um, then uh, there's there's been there's been some really funky ones in there. And uh, right now, my my I have a cold room, and that top yeah. shelf in the cold room uh, is like sooner or later I have to start working through all those bottles. <laughs> I, right yeah that does get to be a problem oh yeah and it's like well wait a minute if i don't work uh, birthday gifts for beer friends <laughs> <laughs> yeah so yeah. i mean it's it's it, it's kind of like i was saying before before we even started talking it's like you go down the rabbit hole and it's 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 yeah. crazy yeah and suddenly you're like this is probably you never thought you'd have like i need to drink that beer like you're you're looking through like i've got like a cellar and you're looking you're like Oh, I got to drink this. Oh, I got to drink that. You know, you, me thinking of me 10 or 15 years ago, thinking that was like a problem, like that, like, oh, I would have too much beer. I would need to be like, oh, when am I going to drink? This? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I mean, as it is right now, I, I make beer and, and it's just like, okay, I've got a couple of kegs. I look up, open my door into my cold room. I'm like, I don't have a couple of kegs. I've got like eight kegs I've got to go through. <laughs> I'm like, it's a good thing I have friends that like to drink this stuff. (laughs) But um, how did you start learning about all the different breweries and brewers? Did you just, did you talk to them? Did you just go online and do your research? Because I know Garrett Oliver is a pretty open guy. He's a really nice guy to talk to. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, like, I... Like I said, I, I just jumped in. I really didn't know what I was getting into when I wrote that first book. And, um, you know, like I, I, I would talk to like local breweries. I live in Denver, Colorado. And, you know, like you just be at the bar and you just end up kind of, you know, at the, with breweries and you end up meeting people. But like, I didn't reach out too much beyond that. I just read like all the time. I was, you know, like always on like internet forums, reading books and stuff like that. So um, one of like just the coolest parts about becoming a beer writer was suddenly like I imagine just like yourself like you have access like you have an excuse right to like exactly. reach out to these people and and suddenly once I actually got paid to write about beer then it was also tax deductible <laughs> oh there it is <laughs> so I would like I, we, this was before kids so like all the time on a weekend you know I'd travel out to somewhere just for the excuse of like mm-hmm. hey I heard there's a cool brewery out here let's let's go out there meet with brewer write something about it, you know? Um, so it was great. So like, I really didn't start like actually having like one-on-one conversations with, with a lot of like brewers and people like in the, you know, the beer industry so much. And so I, until I started writing, and that was it's about 10 years ago is when I first started writing about beer. Um, so that was just like, holy cow, so much fun um, to just get to talk to these people because I had like, I was a home brewer and, and, you know, I, I, speculated all the time about how these brewers that I that made these beers I love like how they did it right mm-hmm. but I didn't like I'm, you know I just felt like oh, I'm just Joe Schmo. I'm not gonna like reach out and be like hey I'm just a random home brewer and I want to know like did you do a double mash on this or did you <laughs> <laughs> but suddenly because I like wrote about beer like now I had now I could oh yeah um, and it, it was it is a blast it was, it was really cool getting just to get that access to yeah. one person i've had on the show twice now uh, i don't know if you heard of him it's horst dornbush and yeah i've had him on my show twice and he is the most approachable friendly person i have ever and a wealth of knowledge like i wouldn't believe i mean to me he falls into beer geek to- yeah. totally falls into beer geek one he's honest and open with what he knows he doesn't talk down to you and he's more than willing to help out at any point in time in the world. And it's just like, it, it, it makes a world of difference, uh, I find, uh, between the two uh, dichotomies, kind of, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? For sure, man. I, I, the beer industry wouldn't be what it is if it wasn't for like people like him, but just for that attitude, that culture, just that, that like you were talking about it before, like how like your local breweries are always just down to help each other out. Like yeah. you, you see... It, it, it seems like people see themselves as like 
hey, like we're if, if our community succeeds, we're all going to succeed. We're not competitors. We're partners, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's cool. Like, I'm curious, like I haven't been as in touch with the beer community, like once there started being like buyouts and, you know, and like yeah. the big the big beer industry is starting to like, you know, edges their way in there and, and how that changed like relationship dynamics and stuff. Um, it's really something that I'd like rather be ignorant of. I would like to just live in this like blissful, like beer community utopia. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, 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 again, falling down the rabbit hole, I got hooked on watching beer documentaries. So, so there was like, for the love of beer, there's, all, there, there's like a king of beers. There's, there's, there's a whole slew of them. And I'm just like, wow. I mean, you, you see, um, the founder of Sam Adams, you see uh, Sam Caglione from Dogfish Head, uh, Garrett Oliver, Randy Mosier, uh, yeah. uh, who else is in there? Uh, Ray Palmer. Uh, there's a, there's a, a, a wealth of beer famous people there. And it's just like, wow, they're, they're real and they're actually kind of cool. <laughs> so so you, you think like you, they're going to have these people and they're going to be like, yeah, yeah, it's this, it's that, whatever else. And it's like, oh no, they're being brutally honest, which is like very cool. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is funny. Like, cause these are people like, you know, if you, if you read the book, like to me, they were like celebrities. Like the first time I met Tommy Arthur, I was like, so nervous. Like, Oh, and then you're like, Oh, he's just a dude. He's yeah. a really cool guy. You know, he's just like, he's great. He's just like a guy who just wants to sit down on beer. You know I mean? Like, um and and I, I would like to imagine that's probably true of celebrities the world across i don't know who knows? i don't know <laughs> celebrities outside of the beer the beer industry but they are just people yeah. <laughs> they actually like when you got a common ground like you know beer it's uh it, it's a lot of fun it, it goes a fun. long long way so what um what in the book did you kind of wish you could have evolved or delved into more of or to share more about Hmm, that's, that's a good question. I would say, like, I don't know if there's anything that I would have delved into more. Well, I mean, I don't know. Maybe one thing would be like, like I said, like, you know, just my tastes have changed a little bit. I think the industry's taste changed a little bit. Like, I'm way more into like loggers now than yeah, yeah. Used, right. So from like a technical standpoint, I'm like, I don't really talk much about loggers, but it'd be fun to maybe geek out about loggers a bit more. Um, but like one thing that like if, if i if i did if i was able to go back and, and do like a slight re-edit sometimes the books was like you know like walk it, it was really difficult for me to really try and walk that fine line of like tongue in cheek and and like coming across as just like an a-hole and there are times that now enough time has passed i go back and i read it and i'm like i was trying to be like kind of snarky funny there but i'm like I could also see how that sounds sort of like snobby, actually, to be yep. honest. There were some things in there that were like, I'm like, oh, if I could do it over again, I'd tweak that a little bit. I'd tweak that, this or that a little bit. But it was it was difficult because it was like a voice that I'd never written in before. Like, I was always like, a lot of my writings, they were, I wouldn't say quite technical, but it was like, I, like I'm an engineer. I'm super into like the, 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 the technical side. Yeah. Technical yeah. side of things. So like jumping into that side was a little different. And there were times that I feel like I missed the mark a little bit. And uh, if I did get like a chance to write like a, a second edition or something, you know, like, like tweak it a little bit. Uh, yeah. There's, I, I might, I might smooth the edges down. So. so what was your favorite section of the book to write? It's <laughs> a good question. Um, you can't say the whole thing. No, no, <laughs> it, certain, certainly not. I, 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 one of my favorite parts was like the the quizzes. Yes. Um, you know, like because they were just like fun. Because like when I think of the quizzes, I think back to like being at tastings with friends, and like and we were bouncing these ideas off of like, oh, what questions should we ask? What should the answers be? So like that was like fun because it wasn't like just I wrote it. It was like. Of like a group of friends and, and whatnot that are just like live a life ruled by beer like yeah. and so to me it was like the collaboration of the sections like I, I really enjoyed yeah so I took you I took those tests some I passed some I failed I'm not ashamed <laughs> it's, it's 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 kind of fear they were just for fun anyway so I was just like 
how am I reading a book and taking a test? I mean, didn't I finish school like a long time ago? <laughs> So, uh, the, 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 it, honestly, it is a lot of fun. The the book is honestly, um, it's very refreshing to see this tongue in cheek take on something that people take sometimes a little too seriously. Um, I find that it actually one, it's informative. Two, it's a lot, a lot of fun. Three, it's. It's, it's almost a guide in how maybe things should be kind of looked at and like, don't take it so freaking serious. It's beer. Yeah. It's fun. Yeah, totally. And I didn't, I, I did buy myself, like I never intended to like write that into the book, but as the book evolved, I did kind of start feeling like this was like a theme and I was like, it just sort of like happened organically. Yeah. And I think because at the time I like, it was like a time in the beer industry where the, I, I would get annoyed sometimes I'd go to Tasty's or you'd be out somewhere and, and that dude would be there and you'd be like, God, come on. Like, up. Yeah, but take yourself so seriously. Like, we don't care how rare that is. Like, yes, it's rare. We get it. But it's like, that's not the only thing, you know? Oh, yeah. So yeah, it just sort of seeped into the writing, I think. So what did you find about, I guess, maybe your, your own home brewing while writing this book because you said you're a brewer so i'm kind of curious what did you find out while you were well while you were writing this book about your own home brewing um to be totally honest i don't think i was home brewing when i wrote this book it was a it was a very transitory time in my life where i i had accepted this <laughs> job where my wife was pregnant we were like it, it was crazy so i brewing was not home brewing was not at the drinking beer i was very much there, there you go there we go but home brewing but no for me like a really big thing that like really shaped my home brewing was writing of that book about the vintage beer book about aging beer okay and like i like i said i had all these like sort of like speculative theories about like I, like, I just knew that there were certain beers that aged really well mm -hmm. and and i had these theories about like why these ones did or didn't but right they were totally speculative because like you know you, you don't you don't know how beer, how beer is brewed oftentimes you know so when i got to start like interviewing brewers about that i knew brewed beers that aged super well and hearing about techniques they did hearing about things they did um that's that had a huge influence on on my home brewing and and really changed how i was making my beers that were like intended to age over time mm. um so i would say like that that would be the one that that influenced it and that's like oh that's like a whole a whole really cool fun niche in the home brewing world because particularly like you said like home brewing you know like oftentimes you end up with more beer than you can drink Mm -hmm. and and it's fun to to mix in the occasional big beer or, or you know wild ale or something like that that like you can drink over five years you know yep. like you bottle them put them down in the cellar hold on to them um i just i'll be i i'll be told i probably have a homebrew in like five years i hope to i oh, hope to dude. get someday when life slows down a little bit but i'm very particular about my brewing when i do it like i don't want shortcuts like it's a it's full day right I'm, yeah I'm, yeah you might like and like i don't have full days in my life right now <laughs> <laughs> it does get easier with kids my son's uh, my son's 20 my daughter's 17 so it does get easier yeah it yeah. does get a lot easier when they get to be like not so dependent on you <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> but the but the thing with the but the big beers I, I i did a bourbon vanilla bourbon stout it came out at around 10 percent. so i've got like a few bottles of those left after my, like got ravaged by friends uh the, the left down there for me to have and it's been six months since i made it so i'm getting ready to crack one to see how it is after six months then i'm gonna wait a year and crack the other one and see how it is yeah so it, it, very interesting that was another part of the book that i liked was when he talked about i think he talked about big beers and things like that in the book i believe and how how it's like how that's kind of trending and how people are starting to get into it and it, it, i found that like wow here's here's a, someone else who gets the idea of of like getting a, a big beer and leaving it alone for a while yeah oh yeah i mean it's it's huge and, and i mean like with the the, the beauty of like, I feel like where the beer industry is now is it used to be like, 
if you wanted to age a beer for the most part like you had to buy that beer and age it yourself right you had to yeah start it yourself. and like sure you could still certainly do that but breweries have now realized like because like as you know you're, you're opening a brewery like space is money and if yes. you got to age a beer on premise or you know you're basically you had to pay the the overhead to age a beer that's that's money and it used to be breweries were like no people aren't willing to pay that right like oh, they're not willing they to pay the overhead. but yeah that's that's never totally been blown out of the water and and they totally are now so now it's not unusual to like go to a brewery or go to go to a bottle shop and be able to buy a beer that's been aged a few years be it in a barrel be it you know in in uh stainless or even in the bottle at the brewery you don't have to do that you can just pick it up and buy it which is awesome um because usually like you know breweries aren't usually uh, interested in putting bad beer out there right so if yeah, it exactly. tastes well they're not going to do it they're, they're certainly not going to put it out there for like a high price tag whereas that didn't used to be true like i drank so much bad beer that i had aged right like it became bad beer because it just didn't age well right, and right. Then, to the brewer's defense that wasn't their intention right it was just this is more an experiment i was going to do but um you know that that was the thing that really inspired me to write that first book was like I was so about aging all these beers. I had this huge beer cellar and I would drink like at least 50% of the beers wouldn't be good. And, and I was like learning empirically and, mm-hmm. and through like my brewing and stuff, like, well, how, how do you identify beers can age well or not age well? And, and I'm like, I got to do something with this knowledge. I got to write something about it. You know, I got to get this out there. But yeah, I feel like, yeah, you don't have to do that anymore. You can just go and buy like a two-year-old aged barley wine or something anymore off the shelf, which is such a cool thing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a brewery out here uh, <clears throat> called Nickelbrook. And they put out a beer called Kentucky Bastard, <laughs> and yeah. it's a it's a bourbon stout, and they have one for sale on their website from 2016, and it's like yeah. forty dollars for the bottle. And I'm like, I so want to buy it, but I'll get in trouble if I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I mean, it's you never you never know, right? I mean, you never know those beers, especially like when they get that old. It's definitely a roll of the die. So, I mean, that's the beauty of beer tasting. So, like, mm-hmm. you got a bunch bunch of friends, and they all, you know, y'all got like your one special bottle. So, you know, you bring it in, and it's like, you know, you, you get to taste a number of beers because you probably wouldn't want to like drink that whole beer anyway, right? Like, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have <laughs> not saying that I could stand after, but I did. <laughs> well, okay. I guess I've always had this mindset of like, I could like take this beer and meet up with friends and they'd be all like, let's just say like, just like high level. Like we all bring like this one special bottle. Then you get to taste five beers instead of one. And like when it's like some 15% big old style, it's like, I'm okay with just three ounces of that, you know, like, uh, or sorry. Hell, hell no. Uh, <laughs> so uh, there's, 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 like, there's a, a brewery about two and a half hours away from me called uh, uh, Stone, oh, Stone City Ales. And they do a bourbon stout called Juggernaut. And I didn't realize, like when I first had it, I didn't realize how potent it was. So yeah. it was all, it was dipped in wax. So I had to loosen up the wax. So I would take yeah. it off, pour it in. I'm like, oh, that's, that's a thick beer. And I just sat down, sat down uh, in front of the TV, took a big sip out of it. And my eyes just went boink. And I looked at my <laughs> wife. I'm like, I don't have to drive anywhere tonight. Right. And she's like, yeah, no, it's like, good. Cause I'm not, which is why <laughs> smell this. And she's like, Oh dear God, you're going to be pickled. <laughs> so yeah. there's, there, there's been a few times I've actually gotten these big beers. I didn't realize how big they were and I committed to finishing the glass or, and, or the bottle. <laughs> it's just like, I was, and I was good for a couple of days after that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I have, I have both certainly been there. <laughs> so what else is coming? What else about the book do you think people should really know about? I mean, there's there's good references in it. There's a good. I think there you put a glossary in the back end for for certain terms and or uh, whatever the um, yeah terms and definitions that you yeah. want people to know. Um, what else about the book should people know? 
Oh, shoot. I'm not good at like, I'm not a good salesman. I'm not good at, at selling books. Um, I don't know. I guess, I guess the, the good thing to know is like, if you're, it's written in a way, right, to sort of be like this introduction to beer geekdom, but really I wrote it for my, my buddies and my friends, right? Like just to get them to laugh because they're like, oh, totally. Yeah, that's totally yep. what we do. So if, if you're like a beer geek yourself, which I imagine you are, if you're listening to this podcast, like, mm -hmm. And you're just looking to kind of like laugh at yourself and your and your friends. It's it's worth the read. I think it's, it's awesome. So, do you have any more projects coming on along the way, or? Oh, no, like I said, I wish. My, I, 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 I think the last time I wrote about beer was like probably three years ago, two years ago. It was, it was a little while ago. I was I was living over in Italy, and it was like one of these things where it's like I had this like brewery, and this brewer that like I just like love. They make amazing stuff, and I'm like man, I want an excuse to go hang out with the dude and, and <laughs> learn, ask him all these questions about his beer. Um, so, you know, I just, I, I used to write like, break, like a column for a, a magazine here in the States, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. I know so that I just, magazine. It, yeah, it's such a great magazine. It's such a great magazine. And um, just called up the editor. I was like, I was like, hey, if I write a story, what you guys write? He's like, yeah, sure. So I got to go out and spend, spend a weekend. It was, um, uh, a brewery they're they're um out from like the, the basically northern italy called baladin and if you've heard of a italian brewery that's probably what you've heard of but i wouldn't like a lot of people probably haven't heard of them either at the same time yeah. um but uh they make this beer called like ziaju and in in, in in it's like got like an x and a y it's like all like vowels and an x i don't know like it's, <laughs> okay. I, like, I i had to ask him that like so how do you actually pronounce this beer's name? Because every time I've had a tasting and someone has it, people are like, what? Go try. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this beer. <laughs> but it's a wild beer. So you as a home brewer would appreciate this. Like, so like Italians, you know, they're very like passionate. Everything is, yes. art, right? Nothing is technical. It's all an art, right? So, um, you know, I, I, what it is, is this like, it's, it's a barley wine. Uh, barrel aged barley wine is kind of probably the easiest category you would fit it into but um you drink it and you're like i've never had a beer like this this is just really a wild thing and um so so you know i then like nothing had been written about it that i could find and I'm like, i want to learn about this beer so god i started talking to him and and uh the brewer starts explaining to me that he's like, oh, well, I don't really consider this a beer per se. He's like, yeah, I mean, it's made from, from barley mm. and, and whatnot, but he's like, no, like um, I was inspired by like sherries and ports. Like he's like, you know, I was drinking like sherry and, and was like, oh, I need to make a beer like this. Right. And so what, what he did was um, he intentionally oxidized like this beer, like oxidized. What? Jesus out of it like he didn't there were, he, he didn't speak English my Italian is was okay at the time so I don't I didn't totally grasp all the technical concepts of like how he actually oxidizes it like is he bubbling water through it or something I don't oh, know really? or bubbling air through it or something but basically like he worked as hard as he could to oxidize it put it into barrels and then like tried to be like as hard as he could on that beer like left it out in the summer like not in the sun right but it wasn't in like cold conditioned or anything like that you right. know like um and 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 then on top of that he would then sort of like blend and so if you're familiar like sam adams utopia have you ever heard mm -hmm. you know like that's a blend right like that that beer it's not like it's the same every year by any means it's like an evolution of a beer um, they've got all these different little projects. Like every Utopia is, uh, I'm aware of has like some of their 1997 triple block in it. And that okay. in its own is <gasps> like, whoa, punch in the face, like this crazy, a little bit difficult to drink on its own. But like it, they, they view it almost as like a spice. To, uh, Chef would view a spice. Like, oh, just a little bit of this to add some character, add some complexity. So you had a similar concept where he's like blending all these different barrels together and it ended up with something that, yeah, you would, you would more closely relate it to like a, a 
sherry i would say like a right. beer sherry and it was just it was just a lot of fun and getting to see like where he ages the barrels and, and just his inspiration behind it so i wrote an article about that i think you can find it on craft beer and brewing magazine's uh website um but it's it's a it's a fun read this is another one that's just like just a passion project for me where it's just like right on well, maybe maybe you should write a book about getting back into home brewing <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 i'll write it in 10, 10 years right that's what it sounds like <laughs> <laughs> to be honest when i first got into making beer uh it was early on in my marriage with my wife yeah. and she went <clears throat> excuse me she went and got me like one of those um the malt the lme kits with the yeah. bucket and everything else yep. Yep. and i'm like oh yeah i'm gonna make beer this is great follow the directions and i'm like why can't i get this to cool down i'm following the directions in the sink it's taking forever i'm, I'm, I'm hitting it with ice and i'm letting it soak and it's like this is taking forever yeah. i'm like okay whatever we're just gonna let it be overnight and then we'll pitch in the morning yeah. and i'm like well there's there's no lid or airlock for this thing i'm like what the hell all right, all right saran wrap over the top bungee cords around the to keep it on yeah and I'm like, oh, we're, this is what it's gonna work and i had my son was just starting to crawl and and i had a dog and you know guys crawling of course they're gonna pull themselves up poking fingers dog comes over puts his nose in it <laughs> and it's just like get out t- tape it back up and i'm like why is it look like it's growing mushrooms <laughs> i'm like oh uh like okay open i'm like well that doesn't smell good down the sink, <laughs> down the sink it went <laughs> so that was my first my first experience with home brewing yeah yeah so that was that was an interesting ride <laughs> i think that's like a common first experience of, of in a way unfortunately a common first experience because i feel like so many people dump it down the drain and they never try it again Yep. I've talked to so many people like, oh, I tried to home it <clears throat> once. And then they've got like a story just like yours. And they're like, oh, I should try it again. I'm like, you should try yeah, it again. Absolutely. So much fun. I mean, I did it for a little bit when I first started. And then I stopped just because like like you, it, young family, everything else, time is dominated by family. And it's yeah. like, okay, that, that's really, making beer is really not that important right now. But now I've gotten back into it. And it's yeah. just like, why did I stop? <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, right? Well, I even had that. Like, I was <laughs> my my intro to to home home brewing story was like, so I, I in Canada the drinking age is eighteen, right? Nineteen, eight, nineteen for the majority. Eighteen if you want to take a road trip from Ottawa to Montreal. Oh, okay. Which I imagine a lot of people probably do. Oh yeah. Well, where we are, we're like, there's the Ottawa river divides Quebec and also, uh, uh Ontario. So uh-huh. if you really wanted to, we could just cross a bridge into Gatineau uh-huh. when you're 18 and go drinking. Yeah. But if you come back across and you're intoxicated and the cops catch it, you're screwed. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, I would imagine they're, they're up, they're up to that. Uh, that oh yeah. Trip. Well, here in the States, as you probably know, it's 21, which yep. like the that time span between like 18 or 19 and 21 is like the longest two to three years of a person's life. Um, so like I had my, my boy was my brother-in-law at the time, but now brother-in-law, um, he, uh, he was, I don't know, five years older than me. He is five years older than me. And uh, he was super into homebrewing. And I was like, you know, like listening to him talk about it and stuff. I was like, man, when I turn 21 off and buy it, I'll I'll have to buy that. He's like, you don't have to be 21 to buy yeast and malt. I'm like, I guess you're right. Wait a minute. I can make my own beer. I was, you know, (laughs) and oh man, that like, it was, so I decided I just went to the homebrew store and they had like kits, you know, and, um, and you know, you got your equipment, your bucket and all that stuff. And then, and then you, they give you the ingredients. And I'm like, I don't know anything about beer. I'm 18, like looking and I'm like, well, which one is the strongest? <laughs> They're like, oh, well this one, this like Imperial Blonde. I was like, oh, I, I will take that one, sir. And, um, and yeah, it, uh, I, I made it all the way through to fermentation, but my problem was I left like about this much headspace. No, it was like supposed to be a 10% beer. And I woke up in the morning to like 
beer dripping off of my ceiling like mm. after it had exploded boom yeah um but i just put the lid back on and it fermented through and it got us all drunk so we, <laughs> we were like hey all right so i home brewed a ton until i turned 21 and then all of a sudden it was like oh i could kind of buy beer i i, I never stopped home brewing but it wasn't until i sort of appreciate learn to appreciate it and yep. really get into it this suddenly i started hearing that siren call back to like oh like because you you'd have these ideas like you'd be drinking this beer and i'm sure you experienced like yeah you're like oh what if you did this to this beer what if you yep. tried this or and um and that that brought me back and that's and that's what got me into all grain do all grain brewing and stuff because yeah. i'm pulling up liquid and all that extract before and stuff so and that's when the, yeah, that really took that beer appreciation to a whole other level where you appreciate like the what like, crafting side of it. Yeah. So the brewery inspired me to get into doing all grain brewing because like here I am. I'm this is like the perfect classroom to learn how to do it properly. Yeah. So I'm watching them mill it, go through the mash ton, hydrate it, mash it, sparge the whole nine yards. And I'm just like, shit this is a lot easier than doing it from an LME can. I mean, it's a few more steps, but it's a lot, you can con do a lot more in controlling it. Yes. Control. That is the key. That is the key. I was always like trying to find these like specialty liquid malts or something like this liquid malt that like matched up with what I needed. And stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then once I finally like, yeah, made that jump, I was like, why did I wait so long? you know oh this is and like it i i've talked to people like that like or i've talked to people that are maybe at a similar situation and like what i tell people i don't know if you if you sync up with this but like i'm like if the extra two hours and the extra equipment stuff is going to keep you from home brewing don't make the jump stick with liquid like yeah. you could still do so much with liquid malt extract it's still so much fun but if you've got a little extra time willing to invest a little bit more into the equipment, man, it just opens up your toolkit so much. Huge, huge ways. I mean, yeah. like I was saying before, I did a blueberry cream ale yesterday. Yeah. So it's still measured out everything properly the way it was supposed to do. But there's a company in Florida called Aseptic Fruit Purees that I get pureed fruit from. Yeah. And so I got 4.4 pounds of uh, blueberry puree into this beer. So I'm like, hopefully this makes it a little bit more blueberry than last time. So yeah. we'll, we'll see. Right? Right. Yeah, yeah. So, a tough one. It's tough for you. Yeah, it, it's, you know, I, I find that fruit beers are, are, are kind of trending now. But mm -hmm. in the homebrew side, not a whole lot of people are being adventurous enough to actually try it. I mean, there's like, oh yeah, I did a milkshake IPA where I get it. Like I hit a mango and this from the hops. I'm like, well, if you're going to do that, add it right into it. Experiment, yes. live a little. Yeah. When I don't know about you, but I'd, I'd often have like, I had like a little sidecar boy, like, I don't know, it was like a gallon and a half or something that I'd usually do like, you know, like I, I'd work at it like six and a half gallon. And I don't know, probably in Canada, you guys have this all in liters. So oh, well, I, I deal with gallons. So yeah. Okay. 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 So like, you know, like all my carboys are six and a half gallons. I do a five gallon batch, but sometimes like if I wanted to toy around with something, I just brew, I just up the batch size a little bit and I'd have this little carboy and then I'd make like the blueberry version in yeah. that carboy. Or like, you know, just some little off thing. And it was, it's so much fun to get to taste them side by side mm -hmm. and really understand like, there's the obvious like fruit character, right? That changes the beer. But what else does it change about that beer? Like what other flavors does it bring about? Positive, negative, you know, otherwise. Um, because there is so much about it. You introduce so many other variables because there's a lot of stuff in, in that fruit that, you know, once it starts mixing with some of those like, yeast esters and phenols and stuff like that can combine to make some really cool things or some really not cool things yeah <laughs> yeah I've, I've had my fair share of things that had to go down the drain so yeah. Yeah. i mean at, at the time i was like oh i'm crying i'm i'm dumping five gallons worth of beer i can't drink down the drain and i'm like i'd rather dump it down the drain and do it again right than be forced to drink something i don't like Yes. <clears throat> You're wiser than I, I, I would always just struggle through those bad batches. And it was so dumb looking back and you're just like, why did I do that? 
<laughs> if you haven't guessed by my beard, I'm freaking old, man. Come on. <laughs> Yeah, like I was younger by, by when I used to home for a lot. I was younger. I could I could I could power through those beers a lot better than I could. Yeah. That's that's normal for anybody who in the, in the younger years and you're in like beginning of university or college. And you're like <laughs> you're on a budget. It's cheap. It doesn't taste good. It's I'm getting a buzz. I'm I'm going through yeah. it. <laughs> It's all good. So I'm going to say, Patrick, thank you very much for being on the show. It was fantastic talking to you and meeting you. Guys, if you haven't had a chance, go check this gentleman out. Uh, the, the Beer Geeks Handbook is honestly, you'll have a good time reading this book. And it'll also get you inspired not only to go out and look for like rare rarities, beer glasses, try different styles, but also possibly to get into home brewing too. Patrick, thank you very much for being on the show. It's gr- had a great time, bud. Thank you so much. This is this is a boss. This is, this is a great way uh, to kind of kick off the day. I feel like I it should have a beer in my hand right now. Thinking about, I, it. I know it's um, it's just like I want that beer here, and it's just like. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I really appreciate the opportunity, and, and like it's awesome that you that you dug the book. That that means a lot to me. So thanks. That's awesome, guys. Again, thank you so much for tuning in and uh again check uh check out patrick uh do you have any social media handles you want people to check out uh i don't no oh I'm, okay I'm he doesn't weirdo. i don't like social media <laughs> <laughs> you want a hard time getting in touch with me because like i don't really do social media it's like all right like I said, you know i got busy and, and so yeah no my my legacy is on bookshelves so. all right <laughs> so you can get you can get his book through amazon your local bookstore and a few other places if you look it up google the beer geeks handbook so Guys, I'm Dan. Thanks so much for coming for a beer or two along the way, and I'll see you on the other side.